And I went and talked to Joe Henry at Harvard um, for the making of the film, The Divided Brain. Um, and he's the man who I think founded the, uh, originated the, <laughs> the um, acronym WEIRD to describe our culture. The acronym for Western Educated, Industrialized, Rich and Democratic. And we think that that's how every society is and should be but it's a very unusual way to view the world. And he said that he and his team went around the world. They went to the, the Far East. They went to Southeast Asia. They went to Polynesia. They went to Africa. They went to South America. They went to the circumpolar regions. And everywhere they went, they kept saying, they're more Chinese than the Chinese. In other words, using Chinese as a shorthand for a way of seeing the richness of what the right hemisphere offers, that all other cultures effectively, other than the modern Western one, have been able to do this. Although I actually think there were periods in Chinese history when it became rather left hemisphere dominated and they coincided with periods of overreach, reaching empire. So in terms of exploring context, and, and because I think what, what it seems to from neuroscience that I and my understanding is that we definitely have that ability to have sort of detail and local and the ability to um, think globally and they're sort of extremes of not being able to do that are maybe autism and schizophrenia which you talk about a lot in your book but is it not quite reductive to sort of dismiss that kind of dichotomy of the left and right hemisphere in one way but then take it as a social construction so what do you feel like the the justification is for that and I know you go into that in a lot of detail in the book but if you could sort of talk mm. us through that that would be really interesting well I mean the word dichotomizing is is sometimes used of course I didn't invent the dichotomy nature did um just take a look inside anybody's head there's a whopping great divide there and there's a vast literature which has largely been neglected because people um, didn't want to acknowledge that there might be any truth in this idea of hemisphere differences, um, which shows that there are substantial differences across a range of every aspect of the way in which the two hemispheres on their own understand experience. So um, what, what happens is that in that book, I probably look at about two and a half thousand uh, pieces of research, and I probably look at another four thousand. It's a much more extensive business, maybe even more. I haven't counted them in this new book. Um, but there is just an absolutely clear, um, of course, in, in, in nature, nothing is ever like cut and dried in 100 percent. That, that's not my point. Um, as I sometimes say, you know, it's very clear that there are many differences between Indonesia and Iceland. And uh, these are largely to do with the climate and they're, uh, they, they're played out in various aspects of the way that life is lived in those two cultures. But it's still true that the highest annual temperature recorded in Iceland was higher than the lowest annual temperature recorded in Indonesia. So there's a lot of overlap in life particularly when you come to the human uh, sphere. But that's not a reason for rejecting what are substantial, significant differences across a vast array of phenomena. And what got me interested in it was when I was doing some neuroimaging at Johns Hopkins um, in Baltimore, looking at asymmetries in the brain in schizophrenia, I was given a tip by my colleague, John Cutting, to read a book that had just then come out by a psychologist at Rutgers called Dury Sass, now a distinguished professor there, um, called Madness and Modernism. And in the book, what he did in brief was to compare the phenomena described by subjects with schizophrenia with um, the phenomena that are evoked by mainly the literature and the paintings and drama, but also the philosophy of the last 100 years. And it's done so beautifully and with such erudition um, and uh, so clearly that it's impossible not to see these correlations. Um, and there are, you know, about 25 of them, 
between these two completely distinct things, what it's like to have schizophrenia, what it's like to be trying to convey the essence of modernism. And I, I was thinking about this a lot because one of the things I had twigged already was that schizophrenia is very like um, a, a left hemisphere overdrive, right hemisphere deficit state. So to an extent is autism. And so it probably wasn't that we were all becoming schizophrenic. <laughs> what was more likely was that we were beginning to um, process life <laughs> uh, through the, 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 the left hemisphere of the brain only and to ignore what the right hemisphere was, was offering. And when I say only, of course, I, it's not, not a hard and fast thing, but that our culture tended drastically to lean towards the very odd ways of thinking about the world, which happen when you privilege the left hemisphere. They lead to disease uh, in the form of schizophrenia and autism, or, or I'm not sure that they lead to it, but they at any rate accompany it. And at the moment, they're causing catastrophic consequences for the way we treat the planet um, and the way we treat other cultures. So um, it's all rather, uh, to me, important to note that these distinctions are fairly easy to line up, at least in the case of left hemisphere overdrive and modernism. And I thought to myself, well, there have been times when our culture has really flourished. And there have been many movements in the history of ideas. I mean, when I was at Oxford, that was the history of ideas was really what I was mainly studying. And I thought, you know, if you go back to um, the sixth century BC in Athens and then move forward to, you know, nearer to the year dot, and then you, you start in Rome at the end of the Republic and then move forward 400 years to the beginning of the empire. And then when you come forward through the to the beginning of the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, Romanticism, the Industrial Revolution, Modernism and Postmodernism, you see many shifts in the world picture. And I started to think in terms like those that Sasser used. And what I saw was the picture that I then unfold over about 300 pages, whatever it is, in the second part of The Master and His Emissary. So I don't think it's reductive. I think it's using a certain lens, which is lent by knowing and understanding much more about the options our brain is dealing with, as, as I put it, the ways in which the set tunes in to the cosmos. Um, it's looking at those in relation to the phenomena that we can, uh, we have a historical record of in the works of art, the scientific achievements, the social achievements of different periods in human history, at least in the West. 